This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. And I apologise, I don't have any images because I'm using oral sources. And also um, that this is, while this, I ca- first came across, across the sources I'm using in that um, uh, manuscript project, um, I'm taking them in a completely different direction from what I'm doing here, so this is still a work in progress. As Jerry White has recently noticed, and as many papers um, over this weekend have made clear, London was a focal point of the First World War, with soldiers moving through it, munitions being produced in it, policies emanating from it, and refugees arriving at it. However, for many of the capital's young women, the war was a rather distant backdrop, even when they worked in war industries. Based on interviews conducted between the 1970s and the 1990s, that Suzanne mentioned this morning and held here at the Imperial War Museum, this paper examines this paradox and argues that contrary to the image of unrivaled national purpose that has been presented by many historians and is being reaffirmed through the the centenary or through lots of aspects of the centenary in everything from the BBC's World War I Uncut series to Downton Abbey, for many working class women, their most pressing concern as they applied wax the gas masks, sewed khaki tents, or assembled detonators was not the war effort, but their higher pay packets, their new hats, and dances at the YWCA. Women's contribution to the war effort was, of course, extensive, despite the fact that at the outbreak of war, unemployment increased by 8.4% for men and 14% for women, with industries like clothing, much of which was in the luxury sector, witnessing a 21% decline in production. As society recoiled from the initial shock, the demand for war materials grew and enlistment increased, the employment situation improved and doors began to open that had previously been closed to women. By November 1918, women constituted 38% of the country's workforce, a rise from 24% in July of 1940. Domestic service had still been the largest employer of women in 1914 and industrial labour was thus new to many, as were the higher wages that it often brought. The workforce at South East London's Woolwich Arsenal, the largest capital armaments installation, rose from 10,866 in April 1914 to 72,000 in December 1917, of whom 28,000, or 39%, were women. Woolwich Arsenal became a huge installation, occupying over five square miles, and thus spatially was an indication of the scale of the war effort. You might think that the women who worked there were more conscious of their contribution to the war effort because, although they may well have worked for wages before the war, they were now filling shells or fitting fuses, work that they had never done in another context, (coughs) unlike garment workers, where women had sewed um, for for centuries. However, while many could recall with quite a lot of detail what their jobs entailed and how they had to change their clothes, removing all metal and putting on overalls, The only connections made to the actual fighting I came across, and I admit here that I have not gone through all of the um, collections yet, um, were from Ethel Dean, who worked at Woolwich Arsenal, and she noted that an overseer would sometimes rally them by telling them, you must do so many today because they are waiting for them at the front. Soldiers are waiting for our stuff. And Amy May, who put little notes to soldiers in the fuses she assembled, also at the Arsenal, for a bit of a kick. Although May recalled the words to a song the TNT girls made up, if it wasn't for us ammunition girls, where would the empire be? Neither woman made any comment to indicate there's a sense of national purpose, or even with retrospect, a sense of pride in the work they had done. When asked, Amy May explained why she went to work at the Arsenal quite simply. Well, that's where they wanted women most, or wanted people most, I suppose. One motivating factor that features prominently in these women's memories is money. Lily Broom, who moved from domestic service to a khaki factory in White City, liked the fact that she was paid by the piece because it meant she earned more, 26 shillings a week. Annie Howe recalled earning nine shillings a week making emery cloth and then 10 shillings a week making gas masks. And Sarah Pigeon noted, we earned decent money three times in the space of a few seconds, even <coughs> though she was not being asked about wages, suggesting there was something, this was an important attraction of the work. These rates compared favourably to domestic service, which, as mentioned, was the largest employer of women at the outbreak of the war. 
The weekly averages for domestic service that the women recalled range from less than three shillings to almost six shillings. So these were a significant increases. For those who worked at Woolwich Arsenal, the difference was even starker. It seems it was well known that the Arsenal paid high wages, although the recollection of a £4 a week rate wage, common in many of these interviews, as we'll see, was in fact the men's rate and double the actual rate for women. Wage rates were, of course, always important to working class people for whom job security and low wages were a constant worry. And some women explained that wage rates were highly motivating. Jane Cox claimed that she was only working to earn money. The war effort never entered my head. It never touched me at all, even though she was making military caps. Similarly, Pigeon claimed that she left a sewing job a job sewing buttons on uniforms to work at a brewery because it was more money. That's what we went for. Nevertheless, she went on to explain that the attraction of higher wages was not about financial security, but about consumerism. Remember, we wanted clothes, didn't we? Only young, but I liked nice clothes when I was young. And she ended with a laugh. This interest in fashion was shared by many of the other women, often in great detail. Jane Cox shared many memories about clothes and shoes, but one in particular stands out. She recalled that on a Saturday afternoon, it was our greatest sport to go to the milliner's shops on Mile End Road and try on hats. And they had a beautiful straw hat, lovely straw hat. I think it was about 2 and 11 or something, and I was determined that I was going to buy that hat. And I did. The memory continues because then tragedy struck. One day on the way to, way to work, it started to rain, and it rained, and it rained, and it rained. And the brim of my hat came down here, and the crown came up like this. Well, when I got to work, poor me, sodden with rain and my poor hat. And of course the girls tried to knock it back into shape, but that was the end of my hat. That was my vanity gone. It's such a shame, my poor hat. <laughs> The vividness of this memory and her fondness for it demonstrates the impact it made on her. As a 15-year-old, it was understandable that a hat, especially one she had craved so much and saved up for, only for it then to have been destroyed, would have been far more important than what was going on in the trenches where the cap she was making to earn the money to pay for the straw hat would end up. Amy May shared a very similar memory that also points to the sense of awareness of the cost of these luxury items. When asked what she did with the rest of her weekly wage packet, which she remembers as being four pounds, although it was likely closer to two, after she'd given some of it to her mum, she recalled that she had a nice two-piece costume, nice coat, quite proud of my clothes I was, a pair of boots, but I always had fat legs, and these blessed boots, I never could get a pair of boots that would lace together like some of the girls, and this pair, I think they were four pounds, and that was a price for them in those days, and the blessed thing split up the back. So I took them back, and they said, we'll see what we can do with them. And they put a strip up the back of them, and that turned me right off. Like Cox, I think it's the spoiling of the bo boots that she wanted so much and had saved up for that sets this memory for her. Cox and May snapped a snapshot recollections of the war years and not ordered around the fighting or their sense of patriotic duty, but around their consumerism. Cox and May were not alone in privileging their luxury purchases or their appearance in their interviews. Others had the experience of making such fancy goods themselves or remembered the importance of looking smart. For example, Deptford-born Florence Parsons remembered that the high wages for munitions workers meant that the fancy hat trade was alive and well during the war because they'd got the money, haven't they? They were all on munitions, the women were, earning £4 a week, which was a lot of money for them, and they'd buy these hats and fur coats. She says those last two words, fur coats, with quite a shocked expression, noting the atypical nature of such a purchase. They all got fur coats then because they was earning the money on munitions. Although Parsons also fondly remembers the hats she herself made as a milliner for upper-class women, lovely picture hats, beautiful hats, the girls didn't care what they paid for them as long as they looked smart. Several historians have noted that middle-class munitions workers women motivated by patriotism and idealism condemned working-class women's interest in fashion. White includes one contemporary observation that starkly reveals this contempt. One could tell a munitioner anywhere. They were no, there was no mistaking the flashy fur coats and the fashionable high-legged coloured boots of the women or the gaudy suits and caps of the men and the money-to-burn manner of both. 
The different attitude at the time and the prominent place of these consumer memories for many young working class women exposes a just disjuncture between the national official memory of commemoration, which is about sacrifice and loss, and personal memories of youth. In doing so, revealing the limitations of the former and its power to shape our studies of the past. Another preoccupation that runs throughout these interviews that many contemporary onlookers also condemned is a women's social life. Selena Todd has recently argued that the story of working class struggle is about gaining more free time as much as it is about gaining increases in wages. And certainly these women's memories reveal the importance of this side of their lives. Amy May recalled, when I was on night work, we used to go to the YWCA for a bit of enjoyment. There, she and her friends would get teas, coffees, dancing, cakes, all girls dancing together. And when asked to describe the women she worked with, she described them in terms of their leisure time, not in terms of her own experiences of them at work. I think they were women that used to go in for a drink and have a sing-song and things. I suppose, she elaborated, they were girls that really went out and had what you'd call a flaming good time, enjoy themselves. I remember holiday time, such as Easter Monday. There'd be several, and they'd have a great big thick skipping rope, and they'd skip down the streets, two of them holding hands, and the others all jumping over, and that sort of thing. Recollections of festivities are in no way unusual in oral history collections. However, the strength of these memories, despite, or perhaps because of, the absence from the official and popular memory of the war, suggests this might be a productive area of study. For May, these fun times were only connected to the war in that the women she described had found industrial work at Woolwich Arsenal as a direct result of what was going on across the Channel. Florence Parsons was a little more aware of the awkward juxtaposition of the fighting in the trenches with London nightlife. The war was on, but they used to have dances, and they still had these big reviews during the war. Not only, were the, not only that, but the dance halls were packed out and the reviews had packed audiences, often with many soldiers in them. Jane Cox made the connection to the war even more explicit when she explained London was a swinging place, it really was. One factor for that was that people from the East End started going up to the West End. Before that, they never went up. As with the changing consumer patterns, such pleasurable activities were frowned upon by many but, once again, we must consider the importance of such activities in these women's memories, and to do so we must remember their youth. Throughout her interview, Jane Cox explains her detachment from the events in France. She notes that she and her sister lived in their own little world, and it was just a lot of excitement. And I think most of us our age, that was how it affected us. Other interviews confirmed her suspicions. Annie Howell agreed... As a child, I don't think I realised what war entailed. I don't think children did. Not unless it's on your own doorstep. Thank God it wasn't. Ethel Dean, who was 17 or 18 years old and working in domestic service when the war broke out, recalled that they were all frightened to death when a Zeppelin passed over the house, but that ultimately the war didn't worry me a bit. The place of the Second World War in these women's memories must also be considered, particularly for Londoners. These were women who lived through both wars, in most cases spending both in London. And there can be no doubt that the Second World War affected their memories of the First. Although the First World War did see attacks of London, as we've heard, they of course fade into insignificance compared to the Blitz, and this is evident in the interviews. Ethel Dean noted that the 1914 war was a lot different to the next war. People running to shelters and all that sort of then, nothing like that. Amy May made the same comparison. I was round the docks, and they had it not as bad as the Second War. Oh yes, that was terrible round there then. And Annie Howe simply stated, World War II was entirely different. Considering the mnemonic structures underlying these women's memories reveals as much as the actual memories themselves. The other memories at that stage of their lives were more important to them. 1914 to 1918, for these women then, was not about the fighting at the front, although many had family members who served, or about doing their patriotic duty at home. Looking back decades later, it was about their purchases and their leisure, which tells us a different story of the First World War, one that was about opportunity and gain, and not about sacrifice and loss. The women were interviewed as part of a general collection on experiences in Britain in the First World War. 
I selected women who worked in some kind of industry related to the war, mostly various sewing industries and munitions, but excluded nurses, the land army, and those who volunteered in other capacities. While the latter groups made a more conscious decision between 1914 and 1918 to do something directly connected to the war, nurse the wounded, replace men in the field, or knit socks, for example, I selected women from backgrounds where wage earning was normal between school and marriage and often continued far longer. Their wartime experiences, therefore, were in many ways not that exceptional, especially not in the context of the way in which the war has been remembered. However, I still expected them to express some sort of pride in their contribution to the war effort or have some sort of stark memories of the war. This, perhaps, is more revealing of my own position than of anything else. Nevertheless, it does raise some interesting points about memory. We must remember that oral histories reveal the construction of memory, as well as providing us insight into the past. As Alessandro Portelli has uh, argued, what is really important is that memory is not a passive depository of facts, but an active process of creation of meaning. And that process is about selection and omission. There can be little doubt that the interviewed women's memories were influenced by the construction of a national memory of the First World War and its official commemoration in the decades that followed. And it is therefore important to note that women's industrial contributions to the war effort have been largely missing and at times entirely absent from the commemorations. And thus the national memory has not encouraged these women to think of their experiences as part of the war. Indeed, the place of the war in popular women's history is that women got the vote because of it. But, of course, the young working-class propertyless women I'm discussing were excluded from the 1918 Representation of the People Act. Because of the sheer devastation of the First World War, Adrian Gregory has pointed out that its commem commemoration very quickly became centred around sacrifice. The soldier's sacrifice and the civilian family's sacrifice, neither of which left much room for recognition of women's industrial wage labour. Within this discourse... Women's contributions were their own losses of fathers, brothers and husbands, not the work they did in munitions or uniform factories. This changed with the notion of the People's War during and after the Second World War, and it is likely that women's far more dramatic and extensive experiences in this war, including conscription and the manufacture of new technologies like planes and tanks at far greater levels than in the First War, served only to further marginalise women's war work 1914-18. to 18 despite the fact that they did many of the same jobs. Thus, the memorial unveiled in 2005 on Whitehall, close to the Cenotaph, is a memorial to the women of World War II, not of all wars. As far as I'm aware, and I will happily be corrected on this, I, I, I stated this as the beginning, yeah, um, there is no comparable memorial to um, women um, in the First World War in London. Okay, no one's shouting at me, that's good. Um, and it seems not only, not, um, not only in London. A search of the Imperial War Museum's memorial catalogue, using the search terms women and work, but not limiting it to a particular war, came up with 54 results. And of those, the only reference to industrial working women, possibly in the First World War, is a painted board in Carling Howe's Working Men's Club in Kirkclass, West Yorkshire, which states, do not forget the women who will have to toil for our men and children of England. Now, it's not clear what sort of toil is being commemorated, although the accompanying images are all of domestic women, so unlikely to actually be industrial work. The, there are many memorials to nurses, as we know, um, uh, and there are other memorials to civilian women who um, are killed, often men and women who lost their lives. Um, but as far as I can tell, that women's industrial labour has not been um, commemorated. This absence continues in the many aspects of the current centenary. The BBC's online coverage of the First World War makes very little reference to women's um, contribution to the war effort, in fact, very little <coughs> reference to the home front at all. The one link of 37 on women's experiences does explore women's war work and the winning of the vote and other aspects of the home front in and the post-war years. But there is um, still no discussion of the war as a time of increased um, consumer activities and leisure activities. 
Indeed, the vast majority of the images on the BBC site and stories are connected to the fighting and or reaffirm the idea of sacrifice and loss. Given that women have been marginal from these First World War commemorations, it's not surprising that working class women's memories are to some extent removed from the war itself. This was not a time of sacrifice and loss for them. Their memories are of coming of age, having some fun and earning a good wage, in many cases for the first time. Using memory presents historians with particular challenges, but also has tremendous benefits. The unique insight into people's experiences is certainly distorted by time, but if we pay attention to that distortion, we can uncover processes of memory making and thus of history writing. These interviews reveal an alternative view of London during the First World War. Even though they all engaged in some kind of war work, these women did not reconstruct their experiences of that time through the lens of unrivaled national purpose, instead providing us with highly personal recollections that at the same time seem to suggest that access to a different sort of life through consumer purchases and leisure activities was central to young women's collective experience of wartime London. Thank you. Thank okay. This story is called Trench Football, and it was very popular here in England during 1915 in accordance with the popularity of football, which was already a working men's sport. The rules by which you play with this toy are very simple, probably known to most of you from the 80s or something like that. Uh, you need to turn and curve the box in order to roll the silver ball along the track and into the large hole at its end. Doing that uh, while avoiding the small holes along the track uh, that will return the ball to the starting point. This is a simulation of football. A uh, football match, actually. The large hole at the end is the goal, and the little ones along the track are the rival players you need to evade. However, this game is, is not merely football, but also the war. The silver ball needs to be scored into the mouth of the German Kaiser Wilhelm II, after overcoming senior figures in the German army, such as the Admiral Alfred von Tirpitz, Helmut von Moltke, and Count Ferdinand von Zeppelin. George Mosse called this phenomenon the trivialization of war. The, the First World War was being translated into, into the day-to-day -day life of the civilians at home via toys, among other objects. Thus, it became banal and part of a trivial everyday life, and it was easier to cope with its tragedies. Football was part of this phenomenon not only through children's toys, but also through language. Paul Fassel wrote about the use of euphemism and showed how the war was uh, referred as a game that needs to be played. What I said so far is, in short, the story of uh, the war as a game, or the way the First World War was told to the British people at home using football metaphors. However, the story that I, that I would like to present here today shows the opposite way, not the war as a game, but the game as a war. My research deals with the physical changes in London during the First World War, how the city changed its landscape, and how the war was perceived also as an urban event, meaning there was the war, a grand event that involves trenches and bodies and enemy soldiers, uh, but there was also the war in London, an urban event that was made up of train sta stations full of soldiers, of ruined pavements after Zeppelin raids, of internment camps, and it was also made up of football stadiums. For example, Stamford Bridge, home of Chelsea Football Club. It actually works. Chelsea was founded in 1905, only 10 years before the First World War, and in that decade, it managed to become a mediocre first league team that attracts thousands of spectators to its home games. The war broke out three weeks before the first match of the 1914-1915 season. A lot of people expected the Football Association to call the league off and send the players to the recruitment, recruitment office to join the, the rather small British army. In a similar way to the rugby league, which was cancelled a few days after the declaration of war. However, there was at least one major difference between football and rugby in 1914. 
while rugby was played by amateurs, the football players were already professionals who received paychecks and were obliged by contract to play. That's probably one of the reasons why the Football Association decided that the season would start as planned, despite the war. But every player who wants to draft will be allowed to do so. This decision aroused the public debate. How is it possible that mil millions of men risked their life for king and country in the Western Front, while at home, 22 men are chasing the ball and being cheered by thousands of other men in the stadium? The recruitment posters even address the footballers and the football spectators. This one, for example, called the footballers and spectators to leave the stadium and take part, of, take part in the greater game, which is, of course, the war. And so, when thousands of Chelsea fans got to Stamford Bridge on August 27, 1914, for the match against Fulham Football Club, which opened the 1914-1915 season, they were faced with the official stand of the club regarding the public debate. I quote, from the opening, the, I quote the opening paragraph of the Chelsea FC Chronicle, the club's official match day program. The football season of 1914-1915 has opened under, under the shadow of the greatest and most momentous war in the history of the world. War was always inevitable, for nations do not believe themselves to build up gigantic armies and navies far beyond their defensive needs, just for the mere pleasure of reviewing them occasionally, any more than football clubs would spend thousands of pounds in players' transfers if they were designed to play friendly matches only." End of quote. Here, the war is being translated into football terms as the European arm race is explained through the footballer's transfer market. But who wrote that paragraph? And why is it such a useful historical source? <coughs> Sorry. The Chelsea FC Chronicle was the official program of Chelsea Football Club. And like today's programs, it was sold for one penny outside of Stamford Bridge uh, before every home game, which means every two weeks. It was four or eight pages long, and it contained everything a football fan needed while he waits with his friends for the match to start. Statistics about the team, uh, the league table, information about the current rival, but also jokes, caricatures, articles, and readers' letters. Every issue of the Chronicle was sold in thousands of copies, and since the reading uh, culture in the stadium involves mutual reading, we can easily assume most of the spectators in each and every game were exposed to the contents of the Chronicle. That is one of the reasons why in my research I refer to Chelsea Football Club and its fans as an urban community in London. Uh, they shared affinity towards a geographic place, meaning the London borough of Kensington and Chelsea, and specifically Stamford Bridge. They identify themselves as a community, all the Chelsea fans, wherever they are. They had their own culture, the language of the football terminology, and the symbols of the team. And the Chronicle was therefore used as their own newspaper, which was read every other week by thousands of community members. The author of most of the articles in the Chronicle is hidden under the title, The Editor. His real name, however, was Frederick W. Parker, Chelsea's uh, financial secretary, sorry, one of the club's founders and a close friend of the owners, the Mears brothers. Parker's position in the club makes the Chronicle a real official document because it was written by one of Chelsea's own and therefore, combining with the circulation during match days, it can be read as a valid historical source that testifies about the club's views. And Chelsea's views regarding the calls to abandon the football league and professional football are presented right at the first page of the first issue of the Chronicle to the 1914-1915 season, the one I showed earlier. And I quote, three weeks ago, all were wondering whether football would be played at all this season. But it was soon decided, and rightly so beyond question, to carry on, as they say in the Navy. The few who publicly voiced their view that the proper thing under such uh, terrible circumstances was to carry a funeral face and mope or quickly silenced. We may be sure too that the thoughts of our lads lining the trenches to do or die for Britain will often dwell on their pet team 
and, the, and in the intervals of fighting, they will eagerly look for news of good old Arsenal, Sunderland, the Spurs, Chelsea, the Villa, Fulham. Not a Saturday afternoon will pass, even in the thickest fight, but what our lads in khaki or navy blue will find time to talk of their favorites and to wish they could hear the halftime score. End of quote. With these words, Chelsea FC welcomed the 1914-1915 season and in a way introduced the war experience of Chelsea fans and the club's fight against the calls to abandon professional football in England, calls that were voiced throughout the whole season. When I looked at the way Chelsea FC represented the, the award to its fans during uh, that season, I noticed two different yet overlapping phenomena on which I shall expand now. The first phenomenon is the usage of war terminology in the discourse about football. Earlier in my paper, I mentioned the opposite phenomenon, the more common one in the research, in which the war is presented as a game. However, for the community of Chelsea Football Club and its supporters, the introduction of the First World War to the football sphere created a presentation of the war as a game. Here, for example, we can see a pun about Chelsea's unfortunate performance and the team's effort to climb to the front of the table. Chelsea is represented here um, okay. via uh, the pensioner. It's uh, the club's human-like version. Who walks beside the Tottenham Hotspur's rooster to the front. In the quote below, we can see a comparison to the advance of the military forces toward the battlefields and to the advance of the football team to the top of the league. In a similar way, the following joke appeared at the Chronicle on October 24th, 1914. I quote, Why is Chelsea at the bottom? asks a correspondent. Because, this is, this is in strict confidence, the pensioner is playing at being a submarine. He will come to the surface again at due time. End of quote. Here, Chelsea, in the form of the pensioner, is presented as one of the most famous war machinery of its time, the submarine, for the sake of a joke about the, its poor performance and chances of improvement. The game itself was also presented sometimes via war terminology. For example, the report that appeared on, the, on December 5th, 1914, in the Chronicle, about the match versus Sunderland on the previous week. I quote, on the northeast frontier, seeing that we had to attack the Sunderland trenches with our forces weakened by casualties, we could scarcely hope to succeed. Now, the words front, attack, trenches, casualties appear here as a euphemism for words from the football glossary and are used to describe a match in which the team had less chances of scoring goals because many players were injured. This is a translation of the war into the day-to-day -day life of the, at the home front that helps to cope with its magnitude, or like George Mosse called it, the trivialization of war, like I mentioned earlier. More than that, this is the reversed version of the euphemism Paul Fussell wrote about. Fussell pointed out the attempt to clean the discourse by replacing the word front with field and the dead with the fallen. In the Chronicle, however, we see a reversed euphemism that instead of cleaning the discourse, adds blood and death to descriptions of reality that doesn't contain them. The result of this reversed euphemism and anti-cleaning of the discourse is purification of the match and a new legitimation to keep on playing by adding violence to the seemingly peaceful home front scenario and making the football match part of the fighting society. And as part of this reversed euphemism, the threat of other clubs was translated into the threat of the Zeppelins. <laughs> we, can, we can see in this caricature a euphemism of the phrase the enemy in our midst, which was mentioned yesterday in some of the lectures, uh, which was used to describe spies, uh, sometimes a general reference to foreigners, sometimes German specifically. Uh, here, the enemy is just the rival team, Oldham Athletic. Therefore, it's an altogether new meaning to the home front concept of the danger at home. The danger here is not an air raid, but only a loss in a football match. And the home is not a reference to Great Britain, England, or even London, 
just to the home stadium, Stamford Bridge, as you can see here. Now, the second phenomenon I noticed in the Chronicle throughout the first year of the war is the stubborn and uncompromising fight against the calls to abandon professional football. It wasn't part of a pacifistic view or anti-militarism. Anti -militar, anti the editor Parker supported the war, justified it, and wished for a German defeat. So what was the motiv motivation for this fight? Well, first of all, Chelsea was a business. And in order to keep it from losing money, football matches needed to be played. Officially, however, the motivation was purely ideological. A decisive objection to the calls to join the army, which according to the club were unequal, based on the exploitation of the working class and supported by the media. I quote the editor Parker from the Chronicle of December 5th, 1914. I quote, the war against professional football, a war carried on by uh, its originators very much after the German Hun style of warfare, is a class war, for it is directed wholly and solely against the working man's weekly sixpenny worth of temporary freedom from his daily round of labor. It is being largely helped by the very newspapers which owe so much to football." End of quote. The, the big newspapers indeed played a major part in this story, as we can see here. The calls to abandon professional football enjoyed a supportive coverage in the newspapers, which were owned by the media barons, such as Lord Northliffe, who was mentioned today and yesterday, uh, the publisher of the Times and the Daily Mail. And so, Chelsea attacked back, as we can see in this caricature. Here, the large newspapers, like the Times and the Daily Mail, are called mudslingers, and it is being claimed that they are slandering professional football and calling the players shirkers and cowards, hoping that some of it's bound to stick. The fight, as we can see here, is not about the war, but about the changes it brought to the urban civil society. One recruitment poster, which was published at the end of 1914, brought this dispute to its peak. Will they never come, asks the poster, in which an injured British soldier is seen near the body of his friend looking at a crowded football stadium. The message is simple. While we are fighting at the front and getting killed, football players and football fans enjoy their time at home. The response of Chelsea, however, was a severe accusation. I quote from the, from the Chronicle of December 19th, 1914. The illustration in the Will They Never Come poster is taken from a photograph of a Chelsea match last season. The bulk of the alleged slackers in that picture are already in khaki. More than a few probably have already laid down their lives for their country. There are more unmarried men of enlistable age still engaged on the North Leaf Syndicate of newspapers than in all the professional clubs in London put together. And what about these peons of the patriotic press? Will they never go? End of quote. <laughs> A part of the, the caricatures and the jokes, the Chronicle published throughout that season letters from Chelsea fans. One of the most touching letters was written by a French soldier named P.A. Odibert. I quote from his letter, which was published at the Chronicle on April 10th, 1915. <coughs> Sorry. I was awfully pleased to learn that Chelsea are doing so well in the cup. I am still interested in their performance, and it is a pity to think I shall not be able to watch any of their matches this season. If I am still alive next season, I trust I shall be able to do so then." End of quote. Odibert wish did not come true. The records of the French army show that he died less than a month after this letter was published. We can see it as another morbid example of the mixture between the two fights, the one at the front with the real life threat, and the one at the home front, in which the tragedy is the cancellation of some football matches. But more than that, this tragic letter can be read as a testimony to the way the First World War was perceived at the home front. War, as life, is a temporal event in comparison to the eternity of the city and urbanity. The soldier might not survive the battle, 
but London and its football clubs will always have tomorrow, the following season, the next year. The two phenomena I described here shed some light on the main subject of my research, which is the First World War as an urban event in London. Chelsea FC and its fans were an urban community in London, and their fight against the calls to abandon professional football was an urban fight to conserve an urban practice, the football matches, against the large event of the war that tried to force changes on the urban sphere of London. That is why the perception of the war as an urban event stands at the center of this fight. And this fight reached its final battle on April 24th, 1915, sorry, at the match that ends the football season in England, the FA Cup final. Chelsea reached the final for the first time in its short history and faced the mighty rival from the north, Sheffield United. The match was held at Old Trafford Stadium in Manchester on a fairly rainy day and was called afterwards the Hockey Cup Final because of the public debate about football throughout that season and because of the large amount of soldiers among the 50,000 spectators at the stadium. Chelsea was beaten 3-0 and at the end of the match the Lord Derby said, and I quote, the clubs, the clubs and their supporters had seen the cup played for and it was now the duty of everyone to join with each other and play a sterner game for England, end of quote. At the Daily Express, the match was summed with the words, quote, the war cloud hovered over everything. Who could have woke up enthusiasm for a mere game when so much a greater game is being waged across the channel, end of quote. And so the Hockey Cup final marked the end of the fight and after it, there were no more professional football matches in England till the end of the war. In a way, at the final whistle of that cup final, Chelsea lost twice. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, apologies if I start coughing um, in the middle of this. I'm still recovering from a very long cold. Um, one thing that must be clear by now at this point, at the almost end of the conference, is the importance that London had for all the British who were involved in the war effort. Especially for those abroad, nostalgic images and memories of London were the epitome of home and the nation, or Blighty. Sorry. Uh, American journalist Richard Harding Davis, in a description of traffic in France, mentioned the long lines of London buses that last year advertised soap, mustard, milk, and music halls, which are now a decorous gray. The London bus, one of the greatest symbols of the city, was, as we heard yesterday, requisitioned by the thousands and transformed from a gay reminder of the delights of life in the capital to a gray utilitarian vehicle of war. Though adapted, it was present, serving as a reminder of what remained as much as what had changed. I'm going to talk about the geographical and popular culture relationship between London and the fronts, both the Western Front and the Balkan Front. H. Constant Owen, a journalist in Salonika, who we'll be hearing from a lot over the next 20 minutes or so, recalled a conversation he had with an officer stationed in Macedonia who, like many others, had not seen home for over two and a half years. He was weary of Macedonia, and his heart longed fiercely for home. Blighty on a wet evening, if you like, with the lights turned low and all the theaters showing their house full boards, but Blighty under any conditions if the impossible could only happen. For those stuck in dusty, heated Macedonia, the constant drizzle of London inspired nostalgia. The idea of London rain probably did not have the same effect on someone knee-deep in the mud of Flanders, but people at every front had a longing for London's theatres. And it was not just Londoners, but people from all over the empire who, again, as we saw yesterday, viewed London as central to the British idea of home. Boundaries between home and front were blurred as London appeared at the front and vice versa. I'll discuss three ways this happened. First, borrowed names nominally located London on the map of war zones, but the disconnect between the reality and the memory of the places associated with these names negated all of the comfort familiarity might have brought. 
Second, popular culture commonly associated with the theaters of London appeared on the front in the form of concert party reviews and gramophone records of music hall songs. Finally, representations of London and London's culture were adapted as those on the front created their own versions of entertainments, incorporating the fami familiarity of music hall style. In turn, representations of the war back in London created a dialogue between the home and fronts, aiding the shared culture that eased the trauma of wartime for all British through familiarity. Participation in popular culture was a way of coping with the war by relying on familiar aspects of life in the unfamiliar world of the front. Borrowed place names meant that London was represented on the front nominally as well as culturally. Shops, eateries, and watering holes that became the meeting places for the British abroad sometimes made themselves out to be the local equivalent of London establishments, such as theaters, restaurants, and department stores. For example, by 1917, a department store called Erosi Bax had become, quote, the Whiteleys of Salonika. Quality purveyors of British goods to suit the demands of an expanding expatriate society. <coughs> and here we have, that is not actually um, the department store. That's just another picture of a shop that I like mm. uh, in Macedonia. Um, and that is a advertisement which appeared on the back of the Balkan News, a daily newspaper um, in, based in Salonika, which was edited by Owen. And you can see there's actually a typo in the ad which is probably explained by the fact that the Greek boy who was doing the typesetting couldn't speak English. Lieutenant H.R. Priest's diary, which is here in the Imperial War Museum, drew a remarkable comparison between the geography of London and his current city, Salonika. He wrote that he and a friend got off at Piccadilly Circus and walked down Regent Street. Every person, whether Tommy officer or aid worker, stopped on their way into Salonika at the intersection known as Piccadilly Circus, which served as a transport hub for the Salonika area. According to Priest, everyone travels this way. Owen described the intersection in more detail. At Piccadilly Circus, this is what we at once called it, and what many of the natives now call it, the congestion is tremendous. Here one broad highway comes down from the Struma front, the famous Ceres Road, and another comes down from the Monastir region. East meets west here, if you like. Piccadilly Circus is on the edge of the city, and every variety of Balkan peasant and gypsy is marketing there, and buying all sorts of funny things to eat from the trays that stand just off the mainstream of traffic. Ironically, every time Tipperary was played, and it was played a lot because the Serbs commonly mistook the marching tune for the British national anthem. <laughs> the British were singing goodbye to Piccadilly, yet they had their own Piccadilly on their doorstep. But this Piccadilly was on the edge of the city, not at the center of the universe, just as they were on the margins of a world created by the war. Um, and here you can see the difference between Piccadilly Circus. That's actually a picture from 1919. And that is a picture of Piccadilly Circus in Salonika. Slightly different. This geographical borrowing was common practice throughout all the fronts. As William Redmond wrote in Trench Pictures from France, trenches are much alike, and there is, as a rule, nothing in the world to distinguish one from the other, save here and there at junctions and corners, boards which bear names just as names appear at street corners. And it is the practice to give the trenches the names of well-known streets at home. There are English, Scotch, Irish, and Welsh names, and most of the best-known London street names figure in that list. When a subaltern is told on a wet, miserable night to take out a working party, and when he is informed that his destination is Shaftesbury Avenue, or Piccadilly, or Regent Street, it does not improve his temper. He trudges off, feeling keenly, no doubt, the strong contrast between his muddy surroundings in the trench and the London thoroughfare which calls before his mind prospects, very likely dim and distant, of leave which may or may not come. Applying British names to places on the front, even if unofficially, can be seen as an attempt to familiarize war environments, but it was also deeply ironic. Of course, Piccadilly on the front and Piccadilly in London looked nothing alike, so people were simultaneously reminded of home and reminded how far away from home they were. 
sorry. It was not just London's geography that was borrowed. London was also imported to the fronts via material goods and popular culture. For many, this connection was their only access to home for months, if not years. This rarity of exchange and the emotional impact of these imported goods and ideas heightened their importance for those on the front. The post, though agonizingly slow and often unreliable, served as a link between home and front, transferring cultural and material goods such as care packages, books, magazines, and newspapers. The musical connection between the fronts and London was demonstrated by Letters Home. Many regretted the absence of live music in their lives and thought longingly of Blighty and London, where the ones they had left behind were still enjoying performances. R.J. Bailey wrote in a letter to his sister, which is also here in the Imperial War Museum, describing a musical night at a division camp in Macedonia. It was the first decent music I've heard since we left Blighty. I'm going to soak myself in it when I get my leave. I gnash my teeth when you speak of Tristan and all those other musical treats that you visit monthly. The songs fondly remembered from London music halls could be imported by means of the gramophone. Jay Winter, in his chapter on popular culture in wartime Britain, discusses the importance of the gramophone in music hall records as a way of importing the romantic and domestic sentiments of numbers such as, if you were the only girl in the world, it's a long way to Tipperary and Roses of Bacardi. According to Winter, the, song, the records of these songs express the world of sociability embedded in pre-war music halls and theaters, a world of safety and affection that soldiers had joined up to defend. Owen described the almost transcending effect of the gramophone. What a wonderful difference it has made to the lives of hundreds of thousands of exiles. Distance is annihilated quicker than by wireless. Everyone is at once in Leicester Square or walking up to Piccadilly Circus just before the dinner hour. London may not be quite all one fancied when away, but how keen becomes the longing to see it and certain people in it. His words demonstrate the power of music and the effect that it had for people away from home, essentially enabling them to travel emotionally or through their memories to the place where they wanted most to be. Once again, the association of music with London functioned as an emotional placeholder for home, even for those who were not Londoners. Music hall songs were a meaningful representation of home and played on the gramophone of the trenches. They facilitated the connection between home and front. Music was a powerful vehicle through which familiarity was expressed. As evidenced by the dull gray London buses that Harding Davis reported from France, representations of London evolved when they were adapted on the front. In turn, representations of the front in London created a dialogue between spaces. The transfer of culture was the beginning of a conversation between London, the front, and back again. According to Andrew Horrell in his book, um, Popular Culture in London, he wrote, uh, it's a long way, I'm sorry, it's a long way to Tipperary was an obscure musical song resurrected by the war. He writes, in response to the troops' love of music, bellicose patriotic songs like Keep the Home Fires Burning and We Don't Want to Lose You, but We Think You Ought to Go is the next line of the song, were written to venerate the cause. These last songs were typically introduced in London reviews before being taken to the battlefront by men. These songs were then corrupted into trench parodies, in turns nostalgic and vulgar, which more accurately portrayed the feelings of frustration and boredom associated with the front. <coughs> Musical songs and entertainments were reproduced on the fronts by touring groups of musicians and actors, and by the soldiers and volunteers themselves. Soldiers' productions naturally took the shape of their favorite form of entertainment from home, reviews in music hall style. Music hall and pantomime tropes also provided the perfect illusions to make sense of the war and identify villains in the war story, not just the enemy, but the slackers and the inept. This helped soldiers not only to familiarize the war, but also to make light of an otherwise oppressively seriously serious situation. As Horrell points out, pantomime, with its sly, fiendish villains and heroic everyman, was an opposite genre for men who were not fighting the glorious war they had expected. Troops concert parties mocked war leaders in much the same way that the miseries of civilian life had been mocked in the music halls. It was an instinctual response by the men to safeguard their emotions 
using the methods they had learned before the war. As well as dealing with frustrations through humor, the prevalence of concert parties put on by troops and volunteers indicates the extent to which they relied on this expression of popular culture as a ne necessary familiarity and a shared experience of home. The practicalities and provision of entertainments also revealed a source of resentment and jealousy between the different theaters of war. If you don't want to fight, go to Salonika, was the title of a song sung in London music halls, which, as you can imagine, was not well received in Salonika. Meanwhile, those on the Balkan front resented the men in France who were sent back to Blighty on leave, while those in Macedonia only got Salonika leave. Salonika was a subpar standby for London, as Owen pointed out. Leave for home was a thing hardly to be dreamed of, but for the officer, there was always the possibility of leave to Salonika. Victoria did not enter their thoughts. It was out of the question, reserved only for those lucky people who campaigned in France. Salonika represented all that there was to hand of civilization and, if you like, joie de vivre. It was a poor enough substitute, but the very most of was made of it on the rare occasions when those of the front line could visit it, although it was not until late in the campaign that it was possible to bring parties of men down, and some of these saw their first town for two and a half years. They were looking round about them with all the naive wonder of a yokel on his first visit to London. Think of that, O oh ye comedians, who sang, if you want a holiday, go to Salonika, or whatever the silly thing was. Some of our men certainly went to Salonika for a holiday, but it was after sticking it for two and a half years or more up in the wilderness. Moreover, in Salonika, they had to make their own entertainments, as Owen bitterly noted. He said, in France, everything that went to the making of an entertainment was fairly easy to hand. In Macedonia, practically everything had to be improvised. No wandering parties of London stars ever went out there, but the officers and men found their own talent. And this is an example of their own talent, a very convincing female impersonator. Um, of course, female impersonation happened in concert parties all over the front, whether or not they had stars as well. Back in London, the war had its effect on pantomimes, which included references to the war, such as images of the troops, both allied and enemy, and weapons of warfare. Moreover, Zeppelin raids forced performances to be rescheduled for early afternoon and early evenings. Conings B. Dawson in The Glory of the Trenches described attending a patriotic music hall performance at the Empire in Leicester Square. He felt manipulated as though the performance had been, quote, calculated to shame men into immediate enlistment, which made him angry for the hypocrisy of the music hall producers. The adaptation of music hall to include representations of war only works when it was true dialogue between home and front, not one-sided propaganda. Representations of London, and thereby home, created a sense of familiarity which eased the trauma of wartime for those on the front. Though naming places on the front after places in the West End was a deeply, if unintentionally, ironic gesture, the London culture of entertainments and musical songs were a medium through which people could simultaneously express their wartime realities and experience the familiarity of London and home. Thank you.